Hey everybody, Nicholas Ward here. Welcome to my YouTube channel. As always, I'd like to say that I appreciate you stopping by. It really does mean the world to me. Uh, if you do like the content that I'm creating here, I, I do ask that you please like the videos and more importantly, subscribe to my channel. Doing those two things will help me to continue to grow the channel, uh, to eventually become monetized by YouTube, and then uh, once that happens, to be able to dedicate more time, energy, and resources uh, towards making these videos for you guys. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, my monthly dividend reinvestments. This is probably the favorite video that I make every month. Um, you know, every uh, I don't direct reinvest, drip. Uh, that's what a lot of dividend growth investors do. That's when you just you know allow your dividends to kind of recycle uh, directly back into the stocks that share them, uh, you know, building fractional shares over time. Um, however, I instead allow my dividends to pool up uh, in the cash accounts of my brokerages during each month. And then at the beginning of the next month, I put all that money to work. Um, I do that at the beginning of the month on a regular scheduled basis to ensure that I am uh, just, you know, constantly compounding my income stream. Uh, so it is sort of a dollar cost averaging strategy. Uh, I do kind of think of the my dividend dollars separately from my cash account dollars in terms of the risk uh, management portion of my portfolio. But I do like to, uh, you know, even today, like I've said in recent videos, I am so somewhat concerned about the market's valuation, uh, but I am happy to uh, every month continue to sort of uh, pile those dividends back into uh, more dividend paying stocks to to create the compounding process that the dividend growth portfolio uh, strategy relies upon. Uh, you can see that in this graph, and I'll let you look at that while I give my quick disclaimer. I'm not a financial advisor, and therefore I'm not offering financial advice in this video or on this channel. I'm an investment analyst with Wide Moat Research. I work with the Dividend Kings, with iREIT, and with the Intelligent Dividend Investor. However, I, did, I do not manage client funds, and therefore if you're thinking about putting capital to work in the markets, uh, you need to do your own diligence and uh, you know take those risks on your own. So with that in mind, we do see, uh, you know, looking at the pink line here that represents 2020, we see September was uh, above last year's total. This is a 6.7% gap here. Uh, my September dividends were up 6.7% year over year. Uh, thus far, year to date, um, through the end of September, my dividend growth is up 10.9% uh, above 2019's total through those first nine months. So I'm happy uh, you know, that 6.7% is a little low, but the, uh, you know, I do shoot for double digit annual dividend growth. And, uh, you know, I don't really manage it on a month to month basis. Obviously, some months I have much more dividends than others. Uh, when I buy shares of companies, I don't really pay much attention to uh, like which quarterly cycle they're paying dividends in. Uh, I imagine one day when I'm retired and I'm using dividends to pay bills, that will be something that I care about. But uh, for the time being, I focus much more on just buying the highest quality companies at the uh, lowest uh, possible prices that I can find. I will also quickly say, uh, as you can see on this chart and the next one I have, uh, I sort of cropped out the dollar value axis over here. Um, every month I you know, go through all my brokerage accounts, I total up my dividends, I put them into this Google Sheet. As you can see, I've been doing this uh, since 2014 and uh, you know, it's one of my favorite things to do. It really just is a tangible sort of proof that the strategy is working when I see these graphs just trending up and to the right. However, for uh, privacy's sake, um, I do sort of uh, just keep the dollar amounts out of it. Uh, you know, I discuss everything in percentage terms. Um, you know, I do, I love all my followers and readers. However, I do think there, uh, you know, needs to be a line drawn with regard to my family's privacy. And I sort of draw that line at, um, you know, the exact extent of our wealth. So, um, you know, as you can see, the strategy is working. Uh, you don't get to know exactly how much, but, you know, hopefully that's okay. Um, with that in mind, I will go to the next chart. As you can see here, this is uh, each monthly dividend since uh, January of 2014. Uh, over time, they are trending higher. The red line represents the sort of, uh, you know, the median or the, the mean trend line there. Um, that is moving up, and it will continue to move up in an exponential fashion as the companies that I own continue to raise their dividends and as I continue to reinvest uh, back into such companies, you know, the compounding process that uh, DGI investors rely upon uh, does work and uh, does sort of grow uh, at an exponential rate. So I am excited to continue to watch this curve steepen over time. And uh, as it does, that will just 
you know, every, uh, represent my wealth and my passive income growing. So that is a, uh, like I said, just another proof. The market is up and down. If you follow my mouse uh, clicker here, you know, the market's all over the place every day, a lot of short term volatility, but, um, you know, the dividends that I generate are much more predictable. And, uh, you know, so as far as retirement goes, I would much rather rely on the predictable nature of my passive income stream than uh, the sort of irrational and uh, volatile markets. So I will be posting a, uh, I just posted an article for Dividend King subscribers highlighting my overall performance during the month of September from a portfolio standpoint. Uh, I do also turn those, uh, those articles into videos for YouTube subscribers as well. So in the next day or two, you should see my September portfolio review, which highlights all of my holdings, uh, my cost basis, my position weightings, and things like that. But uh, this is all about the companies that I bought with my September dividends. So up first, we have uh, Realty Income. I will also quickly say a lot of the companies I'm going to be discussing in this article will be rehashed uh, from recent art, art, uh, sorry videos. Excuse me. Realty income, uh, you know, was included in the five REITs that I've been buying lately a video that I published last week, I think. Um, so, you know, with uh, that being said, I do apologize for the sort of uh, duplicate information. But, uh, you know, I do think it's important to put my money where my mouth is uh, when I'm providing analysis. You know, when I say something's cheap, it's because I believe it and, uh, you know, therefore I'm likely buying it. So, uh, realty income, in my opinion, is uh, one of, if not the highest quality real estate investment trust in the market. Um, it is a little bit expensive here at uh, this kind of $62, $63 range. Um, I actually bought shares. The cost basis of the shares that I bought uh, yesterday on, so on October 1st was uh, $61.72. So that is, uh, you know, you know, I'm happy with that. Um, it's a little lower than today, but I'm obviously not worried about day-to-day -day movements. What I am worried about uh, with Realty Income, as you can see here, is the 602 consecutive uh, monthly dividends paid. The company pays a dividend every month. It, it grows its dividend at roughly 4.5% a year. Over the long term, as you can see, that has generated strong double-digit total returns. Uh, Realty Income is a much more mature company now than it was, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, it became public in 1994, so what is that, 27 years? Uh, I do expect those total returns to kind of slow down a bit, but I am very pleased to receive, you know, roughly 4.5% yield. Like I said, I expect that to grow in line with the a with the FFO, so we should be seeing, you know, low to mid um, single-digit dividend increases uh, into the future. That is above inflation. It's essentially twice the rate of inflation. Uh, so, you know, Realty Income not only provides a nice income stream, but they protect it, uh, you know, from being eroded by inflation with their uh, annual dividend growth. If you guys aren't familiar, dividend uh, Realty Income, um, they're actually showing big properties on this picture here, and that is a nice property. But what they sort of specialize in are single tenant buildings. Um, they're showing the Sainsbury's. That's a, a, a UK grocery store chain that the company has invested in recently. But, uh, you know, what they like to do is, you know, like 7-Elevens or fast food restaurants, car washes, things like this. Single buildings with single tenants. They're not, they don't own malls. They don't own shopping centers. Um, they, you know, they own, you know, relatively smaller real estate. Uh, this 7-Eleven is a great example. You know, 7-Eleven convenience store, gas station, um, you know, one tenant, uh, one rent check coming in every month, easy to, uh, you know, predict. And, uh, you know, most of their business is, is pretty defensive. Realty Income just today actually released their uh, September uh, rent collection details. And uh, if memory serves, it was 93.8%. So that's obviously less than it has been prior to the uh, pandemic. But uh, it is, you know, trending up nicely. Uh, Realty Income is collecting more rent than many of its peers in the uh, sort of retail-oriented triple net space, and uh, that's due to the strength of the management team, the company's, uh, you know, the strong locations that they have selected, the strong tenants that they have. They have a, quite a few investment-grade tenants at Realty Income. Their investment-grade tenants are providing essentially 100% of their rent, so the highest uh, that does also provide me with peace of mind. And, uh, you know, we've, we've worried so much about retail and about real estate throughout the COVID pandemic with, you know, so many companies having to shut their doors or kind of only operate at a limited capacity. But as you can see, realty income is expected to generate 4% uh, AFFO growth 
in 2020, which is a little bit less than the sort of mid to high single digits that we've seen historically. But uh, it's very impressive that during a pandemic, uh, this company has continued to execute. So with that in mind, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy. I paid roughly $62. It's a little bit above my fair value estimate, but um, I just I want more exposure to this company. I want more monthly dividends rolling in. So I was pleased to add to my realty and composition. Um, I'd also added to Essex Property Trust and um, Avalon Bay Communities. These are two apartment REITs that I have discussed in recent videos. Essex, um, as you can see on this fast graph, kind of paints a pretty clear picture. The company has historically traded, especially in the last decade or so, with a uh, pretty high premium. I, I love the company, but I was never willing to buy at these prices. So now that the sort of stock price has fallen off, um, I am accumulating shares uh, on a monthly basis and fairly aggressively. Uh, I bought an initial position in the, uh, I think, 214 range recently. And if the stock dips down below 200, I will likely dip into my cash pile to, uh, you know, to take advantage of that dip. Uh, it closed today at 212, but it was down recently at like two. Um, as you can see there at the end of September, it almost dipped down below 200. I almost had my chance. Um, didn't quite get there, but the stock was hovering in like the 200 to 202 range. So I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, another sort of bout of bad news does push the stock price down to where I can uh, kind of fill out my position. I, I like to average down into companies and that would be great to have the opportunity uh, to do so. In the meantime, I'm locking in a roughly 4% yield. Uh, yesterday, I bought shares at, um, at roughly 205. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the prices that I paid off the top of my head. Um, Memorize. I should have done that, but I will be discussing that during tomorrow's video, and I will, uh, you know, obviously give you ballparks in uh, today's video. So um, Essex at 205. I was very pleased with the deal. The stock yielded almost 4.1 percent at the time. Um, Essex is unique in uh, the REIT world. It doesn't offer geographical diversification. Most REITs kind of want that. Essex is all of its properties are either in Southern California, Northern California, or in Seattle. So highly um, concentrated around sort of uh, tech hub cities. Part of the reason that the company is sold off is due to kind of the work from home threats. People are wondering if, you know, places like Silicon Valley and Seattle, are workers just going to flee those uh, high priced areas and work from home from uh, much cheaper areas? I'm not sure if that's going to play out. We've seen like Salesforce CEO Mark Benioff uh, recently sort of spoke illy of the work from home movement. Um, you know, you just, you, to innovate and to kind of br uh, break new barriers down and stuff, you need to collaborate. You need to work together. Uh, that's difficult to do over Zoom. It's difficult to do if you're not in person. So I do expect uh, there will be some work from home, you know, like Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook has discussed uh, how, you know, many, many of his employees will be working at home. Um, you know, five to 10 years from now, he expects them, their offices to be much less crowded, However, I do expect people to live in these markets because I do think they will sort of attend meetings or, uh, you know, group sessions in the office. I think the, the way that we work will change, but not so drastically that, um, you know, like places like San Francisco will just fall off the map. So uh, with that in mind, I'm, uh, I have been happy to buy Essex property. Avalon Bay gets like 40% of its rent from California, so also highly exposed to that market. The reason these companies love California is because there's such a housing shortage. It actually makes more sense to rent in a lot of these cities than it does to buy due to the high cost of housing. Uh, you know, that's not typically the case in most places, but it is in California. Uh, that's not likely to change anytime soon. Uh, the California does have it just kind of slow building quite a bit of regulations. Uh, you know, we all are aware of that. So I like that market. I know other people don't, but it's an A-rated company, as you can see here. A minus credit score, four percent yield. Like Essex, uh, you know, way off its, uh, its 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 recent highs. It was trading for roughly twenty-five times earnings not very long ago, and today it's down in like the the, the nineteen times range. It did dip as low as the seventeen times range. Um, you know, as uh, if AVB continues to fall, I also will continue to buy aggressively. Because just when you look at the long-term chart, you don't have very many opportunities to buy at these types of levels. You know, during the flash crash, we the flash <clears throat> flash crash. Excuse me, say that five times fast. Uh, we saw shares get cheap, and then obviously during the Great Recession. But you know, for like eight out of the last ten years, uh, you know there hasn't really been a good opportunity to buy ABB. So 
Uh, now that we have one, I am doing so. Uh, I think this is the last REIT once again. Same situation, Federal Realty Trust, Investment Trust is a dividend king with 53 consecutive years of dividend growth. That makes me pleased. The company is suffering here down 29% AFFO expected in 2020. That's a big problem. They have retail exposure. They own shopping centers. Uh, so obviously their tenants aren't paying rent and nearly as high as a rate. I think they're collecting, you know, roughly 80% of their rent at the moment. So uh, that is a problem, but I do expect for them to bounce back. I don't think retail is going to disappear. Analysts are calling for a 17% bump next year, you know, and then slow growth after that. So uh, this company is definitely struggling right now. I'll be the first to say that in the REITs video that I made, I, I noted that I've been buying shares of uh, this Dividend King. However, I do consider it to be, you know, a fairly risky bet. You're being paid 5.4%. Uh, in the short term for that risk and as you could see prior to covid uh you know investors have always thought very highly of this company and they were willing to pay a massive premium um you know during these times frt was yielding like less than three percent so i wasn't willing to buy shares at that yield level but i am willing to buy them here in the five percent plus range i actually bought a little bit uh you know early in the year slash late last year during this dip here uh, I, you know, I didn't know COVID was going to come, obviously. So this dip here is a uh, COVID responsible and nobody could have predicted that. Um, so, you know, I am averaging down into my position. My cost basis is much higher than the $78 you see here. I bought these shares at a uh, $75 a share. I forgot to mention AVB I bought yesterday at a uh, 54, I believe 154. So, uh, my cost basis is down to like 116 on FRT. I will continue to average down into this company over time, you know, while it stays low, just to, to, to lower that cost basis and to increase my yield on cost. Uh, this they just these this company owns the best shopping centers in in the U.S. and uh, in my opinion, the reason I like them is that they uh, I've said this before they like to invest in properties that are surrounded by a high density of high income households. So. They're sort of uh, somewhat isolated from economic trends. Usually the pandemic is obviously a bit of an outlier here because whether you're rich or poor, you know, you're not able to shop during the pandemic. However, during like normal recessions, as you can see here, during the Great Recession, FRT didn't really struggle with rent because uh, most of their um, tenants were able to do well because a lot of their clientele, you know, didn't suffer nearly as bad as the rest of the country. So, um pandemic is a unique environment they couldn't have prepared you know they're preparing for it they're able to pay their dividend you know because of their strong balance sheet even though the um their dividend is more than their earnings this year so in a, in a sense they did prepare for it but you know no one could have predicted this including this great management team so i'm not going to punish them i'm going to accumulate into weakness uh, next we leave the real estate the real estate space to intel I've discussed this recently. I would love to buy shares in like the 4850 range. That's where I'm hoping to sort of dip into my cash position to just add a larger amount of shares. But in the meantime, uh, I'm just pleased to buy shares, you know, where they're at, where they lie. I think I bought yesterday at, a, you know, roughly this $51 area, just added a few shares to my uh, portfolio. My cost basis in Intel is quite low. It's like $31 a share. So I'm actually increasing my cost basis when doing this. But you know, I bought those shares, uh, you know, I began accumulating way back when. So, uh, you know, obviously good companies move up and to the right over time. I don't expect to be able to buy share Intel at $30 a share anymore unless they do a stock split. So I'm not going to wait. I'm going to pay attention to the valuation. Uh, roughly 10 and a half times earnings here. I, I find that attractive. 2.6% yield, well above the S&P 500s. Uh, it's a slow growth company in, in, the, in the near future. They are facing strong competition and they've actually struggled to execute. That's why we've seen this recent dip. Uh, but over the long term, Intel has been a big winner. Uh, you know, people love to, especially in the semiconductor space, to, you know, to basically claim that a company is a loser and they're out of the ball game and that, you know, AMD or NVIDIA or something else is just, you know, totally eating their lunch and Intel's just going to go the way of the dodo. Uh, that just you know, we're talking about a $220 billion company here with an A-plus balance sheet, uh, massive revenues, math, massive earnings and cash flows. W is Intel struggling right now? Yes, uh, they are. 
are they going to go bankrupt? Uh, you know, no, I don't think so. So I'm happy to pay 10 times earnings for a blue chip like this. I do expect this kind of upward trend to continue. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, no one knows what the future holds. That's obviously speculative for me to say, but I'm happy to sort of place bets on, on proven winners and on blue chips uh, when they sell off. So 2.6% yield, 10 and a half times earnings, uh, beaten down tech stock. Uh, I was happy to add to my position. Uh, Brookfield Asset Management is a somewhat interesting stock to uh, analyze. The, I have to use uh, FFO here, their operating cash flow, because that's basically how the management evaluates their company. They don't really use earnings. Unfortunately, the fast graph doesn't do a great job of tracking this uh, into the future. I'm not sure why that is. FactSet provides them data, so FactSet must not be providing future data on uh, Brookfield's uh, FFO. But as you can see, in recent years, it is growing at a double-digit clip. Historically, it does grow, you know, fairly well. We've obviously had this is a you know a cyclical company. It's uh, they and they're they're excuse me they're they're an asset management uh, company. They own um, they're sort of like a toll booth. That's how I think of them. They own uh, Brookfield um, infrastructure. They own Brookfield renewables. They own Brookfield properties. They have exposure to all these hard hard assets from everything from dams and solar panels to obviously malls, uh, office buildings, apartments, things like that, uh, and then to you know, things like uh, ports, railroads, uh, literal toll booths, uh, you know, data centers. Just uh, and, uh, They own so many hard assets, and then I like owning Brookfield but because they're a dividend grower, first of all, as you can see here. Uh, pretty reliable dividend growth. They, they have had some struggles. They're not like a perfect dividend growth company. They have a nine-year dividend growth streak, so that's not bad. But uh, over the long term, as you can see here, you know, roughly, uh, you know, double-digit CAGR almost, average at 14.4. That's pretty good. The yield is low. The company is trading into weakness, as you can see here. I have been uh, very happy to take advantage of this because this company was uh, pretty expensive, you know, prior to COVID. I did pull up this um, kind of their, their their second quarter supplemental just to highlight the company it is hard to understand it's like a complicated berkshire hathaway holding company model as you can see here uh they ra they raise money from third parties a lot of people trust this management team to invest their money a lot of firms and things like that so they have 77 billion dollars of capital to invest and they currently have uh 277 billion of fee bearing capital under management so that's one way that they make money they just collect fees kind of like the hedge fund model on their investments as we scroll down through a lot of this, you will see their fee bearing capital is raising nicely. It made a big jump. They acquired Oak Tree Capital uh, recently, which you know really increased um, that. And I do really like Oak Tree. I thought that was a great investment. Uh, you know, their fee related earnings are heading in the right direction. These are pretty predictable. They're very high margin, obviously. Uh, well, I guess technically they're low margin, but they are quite predictable. Uh, you know, everything is trending in the right direction here. As you can see, distribution to common shareholders is growing you know, very nicely over the last five years or so. I do expect that to continue. And, uh, you know, we do see that their cash available uh, to either reinvest in uh, their company and their sort of sub-level companies in the, in the Brookfield properties and the Brookfield reinvestment uh, renewables or the Brookfield infrastructure, those sorts of things, or to return to shareholders. Uh, I do want to also note uh, when we go down to here, excuse me, where was it? We just, we do see that they're, um, oh, this is their fee related earnings, excuse me, where was it? There was, I, oh, this is what I wanted to highlight, their, their FFO, as you can see, it is, uh, you know, just growing steadily. This is 2020, this is 2019, uh, their AFO per share is, uh, you know, it does vary because they, this company does recycle assets, you know, they'll sell a building, they'll sell, you know, a, tra a train, um, a railroad. So it is a, it's a pretty complicated company to sort of look at when you look through all these numbers. However, uh, at the, as you can see over the long term, it's just trending upward. To me, this is a easy company to buy and hold. I think it's a solid dividend growth name. It gives me exposure to a lot of different uh, sectors and industries, kind of in one uh, easy stock. 
like I said, their management team is known for its value oriented mindset. Uh, Bruce Flats is their CEO. He's kind of like the Warren Buffett of Canada. And then uh, they obviously added the management team at Oak Tree, which is also uh, well known for, you know, its sort of value oriented mindset as well. So I, I view this as essentially a Berkshire Hathaway type investment that pays a growing dividend. Um, I don't own Berkshire anymore. I actually sold my shares at the end of last year. If Berkshire paid a dividend, I would love to own it, but they don't. Brookfield does, uh, you know, gives me similar exposure to a lot of different, uh, you know, things throughout its holding company uh, structure while also contributing to my passive income stream. Uh, up next, we only have a few companies left to discuss. We have Raytheon Technologies. Um, this is a company that is taking a huge hit, as you can see, due to COVID. They have a lot of exposure to the airline, the aerospace industry. They don't necessarily make planes, but they do make a lot of components and things like that. I really like the aerospace industry long term. I think there's secular tailwinds behind it. So I've been very happy to, uh, you know, sort of add to Raytheon several times this year after this big dip. Uh, shares aren't necessarily cheap because we're seeing this massive uh, drop in EPS. But uh, as you can see at the end of 2021, uh, you know, $57 will represent 15 times those expectations. So that's essentially where I bought shares yesterday. They actually rose a little bit today up to 59. But, you know, by the end of 2022, assuming these two massive growth years happen, uh, you know, 15 times, which is less than the long term average of, of roughly 17 times, will represent uh, 70, nearly $73. So if we go to the forecasting here, you know, if 15 times earnings, like I said, that is less than long-term average. I think that would be a very, you know, reasonable and, and, and even cheap price on Raytheon Technologies. That would give you a 16.5% annualized return over the next, you know, nearly three years, a little bit more. If I'm able to compound my money at a 16.5% clip, I will be ecstatic over the long term. I will retire early and, you know, buy a boat or something like that. So, um, I do like Raytheon into this weakness. This is one of my smaller positions. Um, I own Raytheon because I own United Technologies, which uh, you know bought Raytheon and they combined. So I also have some shares of Carrier and, and uh, Otis, the companies that they spun off. So I'm trying to build up, trying to build back up my Raytheon um, components. As we can see here, I haven't talked about this company on my channel yet, so I did want to sort of highlight their business model. They, they do have a uh, defense um, component. So, you know, they sell things like uh, missile defense systems, uh, radars, rockets, things like that. They also do work in intelligence and information and services. So they have a cyber component. Uh, they do a lot of analytics and automation and things like that. Obviously, missile systems is probably what Raytheon is, mo is most famous for. Uh, so there's here. They are also, uh, you know, they have space and uh, aerospace operations. They, you know, they work with uh, navigational things and, uh, you know, they mentioned, you know, high, high energy laser solutions and, uh, you know, battlefield, um, you know, software for these jets and things like that. And the company also works uh, with drones. And, and uh, so, so that, that, that is a big component. They are uh, considered to be a defense company. As you can see, domestic sales make up roughly 71% of their sales. International sales are 30. I like them better than a company like Lockheed Martin because they're not as tied to one product. Uh, you know, they generated sales of nearly 30 billion last year. And, and uh, as you can see here, this is a little bit uh, small text, but um, most of their businesses, the force point is a small thing, but every other uh, one of their segments is very uh, evenly balanced in roughly the you know seven to eight billion dollar range. So that uh, you know does make me happy. As you can see here, their backlog is actually increasing, uh, showing strong demand for their products. I'm happy to see that, and uh, their EPS is rising nicely. Um, this has all happened prior to COVID. I expect these trends to sort of pick themselves back up after COVID, uh, you know, comes back and, and a lot of the aerospace uh, and government sort of, uh, you know, things, um, contracts continue to happen. Right now, everybody's kind of stopped spending and gotten in a conservative mode. But, uh, you know, I don't think that the aerospace market is going to shrink anytime soon. And Raytheon is somebody that will benefit uh, from that. 
I talked about Abby uh, most recently on this channel, so I won't touch upon it here much. I'll link the video above, but simply put, to me, this is one of the cheapest companies in the market. Trading at just eight and a half times earnings offers five and a half percent dividend yield. It's expected to grow its bottom line at double digit clip for the next three years. Uh, the Humira Patent Cliff in 2023 is the big sort of headwind that's keeping the stock low, but to me, uh, shares are trading for, for just 6.7 times, even a little less now because the shares have dropped since the, the last video. So like six and a half times those 2023 year-end expectations once Humira comes off the books. Uh, that could be, we could see like a multi-year downtrend in earnings as the company attempts to kind of repair its uh, revenue stream, uh, you know, as generic competition begins to hurt Humira. But to me, you know, we look at all the major biotech plays, all the major sort of biopharma plays, big, big pharma names. Nobody's trading at six and a half times earnings. So you give me a, a high quality company like this. They have a pretty good uh, pipeline. They they just acquired Allergan. So they have all of Allergan's cash flows, Botox, a lot of the big drugs in that portfolio. Um, so, you know, I'm happy, very, very happy to be accumulating ad fee at six and a half times earnings. Uh, I, I think the dividend safe, as you can see here, there's a big uh, margin between the dividend here and the earnings stream. Um, so to me, this is a five and a half percent yield that's likely to grow at a high single digit, low double digit clip. And, uh, you know, if we see mean reversion back up to like, you know, the 10 to 12 times range, which is where I think is fair, you know, we're talking massive, massive forward looking returns. You know, even like I said, at the end of 2023, once Humira begin to come off the books, you know, we're still talking annualized gains of roughly 24% uh, a year. Uh, like I said, that's even above that 16% times that uh, Raytheon was showing at, at what I believe to be a fair value for that company. So, uh, you know, I think there's a double digit CAGR opportunity here. In the meantime, I'm paid nicely. Uh, so I'm very happy to buy Advi and uh, also Altria. I talked about this recently. I will link that video as well for the more details, but uh, once again, nine times earnings. This has a nearly 9% dividend yield. Uh, the dividend yield is covered nicely by earnings. The payout ratio, as you can see here, is essentially in line with with the history. It has risen in uh, over the last decade or so, but this is uh, you know where the tobacco industry kind of sits these days in this kind of 80% range. Uh, Altria still has a much lower payout ratio than like Philip Morris does, for, uh, for instance. Uh, the company's EPS growth is very, very reliable and predictable. As you can see in the last 20 years, there's only one negative EPS year. Here in 2003, even during the Great Recession and during the dot-com boom and bust, the company grew its bottom line. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, the company is still growing its bottom line. Uh, you know, Altria does rely on cigarettes. They are branching into other forms of nicotine and, uh, you know, also uh, marijuana and things like that. But Ultimately, you know, people just love to hate this company because they think that cigarettes are going away. Ultimately, they will. Volumes are shrinking at, you know, a mid single digit clip annually. And uh, yet, even with that being said, this company still manages to use its pricing power and to use, you know, the strength of its management team to generate growing earnings. So you give me a 9% nine, a nine yield that appears to be safe at a 9% uh, PE ratio, at a 9 times P to E ratio. I love that. Uh, over the long term, the company has a 14 times average P to E. You know, I, I look, even if we're being conservative and saying that the company deserves a 12 times average P to E because of growth headwinds, uh, you know, once again, over the long term, we're still talking 25% plus annualized returns here. Uh, even at 10 times, 20, 20 times, it's, it's just incredible to me, right? Like 10 times earnings for a dividend aristocrat, a blue chip company with a 9% yield, and you're also potentially going to lock in, you know, very strong double digit gains like this. Um, with that in mind, this is why I haven't been even looking to, you know, Altria has struggled quite a bit in uh, recent years, as you can see here, but I'm not thinking about selling my shares at all. And I continue to add to my position um, I'm happy to pay attention to the fundamentals rather than the sentiment and to, you know, just trust this management team to turn this uh, company around. But in the meantime, I get paid a, a hefty yield and, uh, you know, hopefully the management doesn't even really need to turn the company around. Management's doing fine. Um, the market just needs to change it, its, its mind and its sentiment. I don't know if that'll happen, but I do know I'll get this dividend in the short term. I expect to receive it over the long term as well. 
so with that in mind, Altria is the last company that I bought this month. And uh, so, you know, mostly real estate this month. That's where I see a lot of the value, mostly high yield. Um, you know, BAM has roughly a, a percent and a half percent yield. I didn't mention it. Uh, Raytheon yields. Um, here it is. You know, roughly 3.2%. So this is actually a pretty hefty yield. The uh, S&P 500 yields like 1.8% right now. So um, I'm really, you know, bolstering my passive income stream with nearly all of these purchases. They all are growing their dividends reliably. And uh, I expect for that to continue. So uh, very pleased with this month's, uh, you know, selective reinvestments. And I look forward, obviously, to collecting dividends throughout the month of October and to making this video again in early November uh, once I do those uh, investments as well. So thanks, everybody, for you know sticking around. If you made it this far, uh, like I said, there will be a portfolio review or a video being posted in the next day or two. So until then, uh, stay happy, stay safe, uh, stay healthy, and I hope you guys have a great week. Thank you. Bye.